Hey guys, this video is going to be a little weird. As of the recording of this, it's April 9th, 2020. I don't know when I'll be publishing this video or if this is only going to be available to patrons, but it's likely going to be quite a while into the future if it does go live. Why, you ask? Well, every so often something happens in my life that will either take me away from my computer or takes up all my time so I can't make videos. So I'm recording this as sort of a safety video, just in case. That way I don't miss an upload. We're going to experiment a little bit and do a bit of a podcast style video, so tell me if you enjoyed this. Anyway, what will we be talking about here? I thought we could take a bit of a step back from all the conspiracy theories and misinformation in the world and just talk about science. You and me and science. Because what I realized is that a lot of people talk about science as sort of a concept, you know? Some people say science is great and is the best way to discovering truth about the universe, like me. I say that all the time in my videos. Some other people say science is not reliable or biased or whatnot. At the end of the day, talking about science as a method is fun and all, but we don't talk too much specifically about the contents of science. So today's rant is going to be on epigenetics, and the reason I chose this topic is because lots of people don't know what that is, despite it being such a massive topic in molecular biology. I'll give a brief introduction first. So, if you're someone who's involved in medical research at all, you'll notice that a lot of our work revolves around genes. Over the past few decades, we've tried to find better and better methods of sequencing DNA and working with the A's, T's, C's, and G's. You go anywhere, you join any lab, and a lot of the focus will be on the genetic code. However, there's always more to the story. Back when we were first sequencing the human genome, we thought this would really solve the problem of a lot of genetic illnesses, that we would finally obtain the key to eliminating such diseases. Then, after that's been done, we realized there was another aspect that deserves a lot more attention than we are giving it. You can sort of imagine epigenetics as sort of the 3D structure or aspect of DNA. Imagine if you had an instructions manual on how to build a piece of furniture, let's say a chair. Except this manual is not meant to be read from the first page to the last, but rather is all scrambled up. In this case, the instructions to build the chair is in the book, but how you read it matters on your final construction. This isn't the best analogy, but you can think of DNA as sort of the same way. The code is there, our genes are there, the instructions to build the proteins are there, but these are heavily controlled by our epigenome on how it is read, how often genes are read, and if the genes are read at all. Essentially, it controls expression. Having a gene that, say, is essential to our well-being is useless if it is silenced. Meanwhile, a gene that could potentially be detrimental wouldn't be as, as harmful if its expression is blocked. This is epigenetics. By understanding this field more, we can achieve much more than we can imagine, which is why I say this field deserves more attention. Now that we're done with the introduction, let's see how cells actually achieve such a feat. As you know, all our cells are genetically the same. They have the same DNA and the same genes. What makes a cell differentiate into whatever type of cell they're supposed to be is controlled by your epigenetics. Your skin cells have the same genetic code as your muscle cells, for example, but each only expresses the particular gene that defines its function. If the epigenome doesn't properly assign the uh, proper function to cells, then many errors could occur. They can become senescent or they could become cancers. There are a number of ways the cells could control expression. First, there are histone proteins that are responsible in wrapping DNA to create nucleosomes. These histones themselves can have certain markers attached to them to change their function. The most, uh, most common is a methyl group or an acetyl group onto the histone tails. Usually they're attached to lysine amino acids, and you end up with a pretty logical naming system such as H3K27ME3, for example. H3 represents the third histone. There are only a few of them. K27 means it is attached to the lysine that is on position 27 of the histone protein. ME3 means it is trimethylated, meaning three methyl groups are attached to the same lysine amino acid residue. From this, you can get a lot of combinations. Their effects you know, depend a lot on context, but some of them follow a certain pattern. H3K27 ME3 is normally associated with silencing effects. DNA that is wrapped around it usually has its transcription blocked. Meanwhile, you can also have acetylation, where you attach an acetyl group. These are more straightforward than methylation because they are almost always activating. Other than these two, you can also have ubiquination, phosphorylation, and so on, but these are less common and have less to do with the gene regulation. So, brief summary. Histones are proteins that wraps itself around DNA, and you can control expression by modifying or attaching certain elements into the hist- onto the histone proteins. Easy enough to understand. But that's only one aspect of the grand scheme of epigenetics. You can also have DNA methylation, for example. Uh, Instead of methylating the histone proteins, you can methylate the DNA directly. The effects of this entirely depends on how the methylation occurs. But if you're in doubt, it's more likely a silencing effect. 
if you're covering your gene, uh, if you're covering your gene promoter with methyl groups, uh, proteins that transcribe the DNA, such as transcription factor and polymerases, are going to have a more difficult time binding to the promoter. That means less transcription, which means less overall expression. But if you methylate in other areas, such as the body of a gene, sometimes you can activate the expression of the gene by inhibiting the promoter of a gene that runs in the opposite strand, because it alleviates competition for space. Uh, or, for example, if you methylate an insulator or silencer that controls the gene, you could also amplify its expression. Fascinating, isn't it? The cell micromanages this entire thing automatically, so we don't even have to worry about it. Unfortunately, it can be easy to make a mistake, such as a mismarking that can lead to multiple diseases. Uh, some even hypothesize that it's the errors of the epigenome that causes people to age. But the power of epigenetics doesn't just stop there. It has a lot of influence on ourselves and our offsprings. You ever wonder why identical twins never grow up to be exactly the same? That's because of the epigenome. Environmental influences has a lot to do with how our genes are expressed, and this is passed down to next generations. Take the Dutch hunger study, for example. During the time of famine from 1944 to 1945, children who were born during this time inherited some very intriguing epigenetic markers. They were initially born to be lower in weight. But it's what happened afterwards when they were growing up that's interesting. Two groups of children were followed when growing up. One lived in famine conditions, just like their parents, and another group had plenty supplies. It turns out that the second group had a higher chance of developing diabetes, obesity, and glucose intolerance, while the first group were more or less normal. Can you see why? The parents who experienced famine right before parturition had their epigenetic markers reprogrammed to slow down metabolism and conserve energy, which was passed down to their offsprings. The offspring who grew up with normal amounts of food and supplies ended up with higher chances of diabetes because their metabolism was epigenetically reprogrammed to live in a state of famine. And this is what later on resulted in more experiments on when this uh, epigenetic reprogramming happens. It turns out that the mother has a bit more influence. Since the female has all her eggs at birth and do not produce more in her lifetime, reprogramming could happen at any stage of her life technically. However, it seems that there is a more specific time frame in which this is more influential. Females go through ovulation every month or so, and during this time the oocytes go through the first round of meiosis, not the second round of meiosis because that happens after fertilization. And it is discovered, or at least suspected, that it is after this first meiotic event and before fertilization in which epigenetic reprogramming to the offspring is more, most influential. Fathers are a little bit different because they are always constantly producing new spermatocytes. Admittedly, not all of this has been figured out yet. Scientists are still working on it. Don't go and do random stuff in an attempt to reprogram yourself, especially if those activities are harmful to you. So what is the point of all of this? Well, most importantly, it is a field of science that may hold a lot more power than we think. Not all the secrets to our genome can be obtained from just evolving our sequencing technologies, but what this really shows us is how little we know. Perhaps there is even a layer on top of epigenetics that also plays uh, you know, a huge role. There is just so much more to discover and so much more we can do to advance our biological knowledge. And that's what I love about science, it never stops evolving. Our curiosity will never be satiated, and science will always continue to develop. That is the beauty of science. Anyway, did you enjoy this mock podcast? I've been thinking about starting some sort of podcast channel or something, but as you can tell, I'm not really that great at speaking without editing my audio. Wait, maybe I already started a podcast by the time this video goes live. Who knows? Anyway, that's it for today. I only gave a brief introduction to epigenetics, so I highly recommend doing some reading on your own. If you are interested, there are so many more aspects to this topic, such as mRNA destruction to regulate gene expression. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Did you know that RNA can be used to destroy other RNA as a way to regulate proteins? Bet you didn't know that one. These are called small RNAs, which includes MI and SI RNAs. They form these complexes called RISC and RITS, which serve to alter expression. I won't go into too much detail now because I bet you're all hungry to learn more about that yourself via the internet. So yeah, if you're still new to this topic, there's always Wikipedia. No one wants to sit through scientific papers when Wikipedia can summarize everything for you. Okay, that's sort of a joke, and also not a joke. Don't go too ham on secondary sources. But if you're going to do it anyway and had to choose one, Wikipedia is probably one of the better websites out there. So, people of the future, tell me, how has the coronavirus been? Has it died down yet? How is my channel doing? Have I finally decided to quit? <laughs> okay, bye.